Uh, I'm glad you're the lucky ones uh, that got to participate in the largesse for these delicious meals uh, that we've provided uh, from high noon. Um, I haven't gotten one yet. I'll have to tell my staff to make sure they bring, bring one of these up to me. We so rarely offer um, food, but I, I felt just in that mood. Uh, so don't get used to it. Um, <laughs> And, and, but it is good to have you all. I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. We've got a great group here today. But let me tell you what I sort of had in mind in thinking about um, a, no, a number of issues, why I wanted to have today's event and where it is leading. Uh, New America Foundation has now, and I guess I can formally announce it, uh, is, is uh, the recipient of, of support both from uh, uh, Leo Hendry, who chairs our new Smart Globalization Initiative and a new major grant from the Sloan Foundation to think through the contours of um, how the global economy is working, how it intersects with the American economy, how to get policy right at a point where folks like Alan Blinder and Larry Summers and Paul Samuelson and many of the sort of top tier economic brains in the world are at a moment of introspection about how the benefits and impacts <coughs> of globalization are being distributed and to try to think through what a national policy framework ought to look like that doesn't fall into either the old ruts and grooves of what I would consider to be, you know, the, the, the trade skeptic, uh, more labor focused, um, I hate to say the word, but we'll call it a kind of a more protectionist cap versus a kind of manic neoliberalism that uh, didn't see, you know, any, any trade deal it didn't want or any terms that it didn't want and thought probably at last end uh, in their thinking about what might be most beneficial uh, to the manufacturing sector in the United States, the American middle class. We're trying to think about this, which means we're engaged in, in as much asking questions as we are about setting terms for what we think uh, should be the outcome uh, where we're not yet. That's the Smart Globalization Initiative, and you're going to see ramped up work from the New America Foundation on this. The man to my immediate right, Leo Hendry, uh, whom, whom we all know uh, uh, very well from uh, having won Le Mans uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, but, but others know him as the former senior economic advisor for Senator John Edwards and the John Edwards campaign. He's currently acting as an economic um, advisor to Senator Barack Obama uh, in a, in a um, I shouldn't say informal, and often a formal capacity, but, but in a different capacity than he was with John Edwards. He chairs our new Smart Globalization Initiative here at the New America Foundation, and we are <laughs> Um, very pleased with that relationship and our friendship with uh, Leo. He's the formerly the CEO of the Yes Network, um, the television home of the New York Yankees. He was CEO of AT&T Broadband, uh, vice chair of the Health Commission formed by Congress to improve and think about U.S. foreign assistance. And he's now managing partner of Intermedia Partners, a New York-based media industry private, equ private equity fund. But Leo, um, as, as well, and when we got into this, has been thinking for a long time about not just what's going on in terms of the financial and, and, and investment portfolio of the United States. As good. He wrote a book called It Takes a CEO, and it had a lot of impression, made a big impression on me because it really was trying to think through more of a stakeholder approach, what were the incentives and disincentives, disincentives for more uh, 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 collective collaboration when it comes to thinking about not only just running a firm and thinking about the labor side of this and some of the perverse things that have been going on between the distance between the highest paid CEOs and others in the firm, but it, but it really was looking broadly at the economy and it was important. Tom Gallagher, a member of the Leadership Council here at the New America Foundation, uh, a very good friend, is Senior Managing Director of, of the ISI Group and Head of its Policy <coughs> Research Team in Washington. He's been ranked number one uh, uh, in, in an International Investors Washington Research category during the five years as its top uh, ranked analyst. Uh, prior to joining ISI, he spent 13 years at Lehman Brothers and eight years in the federal government. Um, he g recently gave a talk up at uh, the New School uh, for social research in a, uh, was it, no, it was in, it was New School. And it was the Bernard Schwartz Center there. We happen to have a Bernard Schwartz Fellowship Program here. I haven't figured out if they're the same guy or not. Uh, uh, actually, I do know that they are. But uh, there was a conference that New America helped co-sponsor up there with Laura Tyson, uh, one of our people, Heidi Crabo Redeker, who is an expert on sovereign wealth funds and thinking about the strategic dimensions of global finance. And I was stuck on a plane that never made it to New York, but I got all of these emails and saying, who is this Tom Gallagher guy? This is brilliant. He's really fantastic up in this talk. <coughs> And it's thus largely in part of that that I wanted to make sure that we also had Tom and his views down here. Today's event, 
which I somewhat provocatively titled High Oil Prices, Plummeting Home Values, and the State of Middle Class America. Leah called and said, make sure we put in sovereign wealth funds, too, uh, which, which are hereby added uh, metaphorically. But, but what I'm interested in today is when you think about the dynamics in the, in the economy, there are some factors that are changing. And I actually want to ask the question whether high oil prices actually may be good to a certain degree to achieve certain outcomes. We used to talk about time and distance being shrunk in the global economy because there was essentially zero cost in transport. I'm not so sure that's true anymore. We at least need to think through some part of that, of that equation. Um, but there are other issues hitting the economic portfolios of Americans, and I'd like to begin wrestling with both long-term as well as near-term thinking, and this is going to be as much a discussion. We were going to do this around a, a roundtable originally, but there are too many of you. Uh, but we are online. We've got a, a somewhere between 150 and 200 people here uh, with us as well, watching what we're, what we're doing right now with streaming live on the Washington Note and on uh, the New America Foundation website. So we're going to start with some presentations by, by Leo Hendry and Tom Gallagher, and then I'm going to try as best I can to run this like a lunch salon. <coughs> so uh, enjoy your sandwich, and uh, let me first ask Leo Hendry to join us. Leo? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is really a pleasure, uh, always with Steve, but uh, uh, certainly no less with Tom. And, and I think uh, Tom will tell you the real reason we wanted to do this is because the subtitle of what Steve has put forward today is how high oil prices are gut-punching the American middle class. And <clears throat> that's the sort of come on that uh, Tom and I, we need just a little bit of that to be here with you. Uh, let me start by, by uh, putting forward two questions that were asked just late last week. And I, and I think they'll set a tone for, for some of the comments I'm going to try to share. These were actual questions put forward to a prominent individual who I'm going to tell you about in a bit. First question was, oil prices are headed for their seventh straight year of gains. Why such a sustained run-up in prices? Answer, this is a case of demand-driven increases. <coughs> question number two, what has been the impact of financial investors or speculators in the market? Answer, I'm not quite sure I know that. The person to whom the questions were posed and, and the one who was answering was a very prominent individual, David J. O'Reilly who's actually the CEO of Chevron. Uh, what Tom and I are going to do, and I especially, I'm going to try to help Mr. O'Reilly answer the second question w with more precision and, and perhaps more insight than he was willing to share uh, when these questions were posed to him last Friday. <coughs> I'm going to start by, by sharing with you four numbers and then try to, to build a theme around them, if I might. The first number is, is the number $11 trillion. Eleven trillion dollars is the combined worth of the world's sovereign wealth funds, but it also includes the other government-controlled investments such as overseas financial investments and government development funds and investment corporations. The second number, one you probably not have heard at all, is the number ninety billion dollars. That's the amount that has moved into all commodity index investments since January of 2006 that has no underlying physical commodity exposure. $135, a number we know well, it's the current price of a barrel of oil. And the fourth number, the one that is gut punching the middle class, is $4.50, which is what $150 a barrel oil will produce. So let's talk about these numbers and help answer for Mr. O'Reilly how, uh, how they might be impacting financial investors in the market. Uh, years ago, uh, Tom was, as, as Steve said, at Lehman Brothers. Uh, last month, some very clever young guys at Lehman <coughs> calculated that crude oil futures go up 1.6% for every $100 million of inflows into the oil-related commodity indexes. These same ana analysts were the ones who also confirmed that when oil is trading at uh, uh, what many believe is its normalized production cost level of around $60, an unbelievable $90 billion, as I said, of new monies has, has moved into all the various commodity index investments, for which, again, notably, there was no underlying physical commodity exposure. In other words, as Lehman commented, this is all financial money. It seems to me that it wouldn't have taken Mr. O'Reilly's oil analyst at Chevron 
as contrasted with these clever young guys at Lehman, very much effort to conclude that out of that $90 billion that went into all commodity indexes, almost assuredly enough went into just the oil-related indexes to explain a goodly portion of the $77 increase in the price of oil since January 2006 as it's moved from $58 a barrel to $135 a barrel. We spent some time with these numbers and we now know and in fact think we can prove that at least one third and perhaps as much as one half of this 133 percent increase in the price of oil over the past 30 months is due to this flood of what are called non-exposed commodity index investments. The other half of this increase, albeit still very painful in amount, is a combination since then of further geopolitical risk, especially that associated with Iran, very high ongoing consumption as we all know in China and India, and the effects of a dramatically fallen dollar on a commodity which at least for now is priced still only in dollars. In other words, at least $26 of the current $135 price per barrel of oil and as much as $39 is all due to pure speculation for which there again is no underlying commercial motivation. It's a staggering and unacceptable burden on the bank, on the backs and on the wallets of average Americans and it is the impetus in my opinion to very much of the $4.50 gas which those same Americans pay every day now at the pump and it, it demands our immediate attention. But all of this is a completely unacceptable burden if, as I believe is the case, a substantial amount of these new inflows into the oil-related indexes is coming not from traditional speculators, if there is such a thing, but rather from the governments of the oil-producing countries which are now selling us that oil for $135 a barrel. Uh, the esteemed Congressman John Dingell and his, con and his congressional colleagues are, as of yesterday, trying to close this big as a Mack truck truck loophole which has allowed swap dealers with no f physical commodity exposure to, res to receive exemptions from position limits and we admire them for that. To quote the congressman, what we have today is quote, a remarkable departure from the spirit and the intent of the Commodity Exchange Act which once only allowed users of commodities to hedge their legitimate anticipated business needs. But while the Congress is trying to improve the trading rules, we need to find out precisely, those of us in the room and elsewhere in this city, how much of the inflows into the oil-related commodity index have in fact been coming from OPEC members. And then we need to do everything we can to constrain them, including preventing traders from routing transactions through offshore markets, which is greatly contributing to the abuse. These so-called investments by oil producing countries have little if anything to do with making trading profits and they are mostly about putting a floor first under the price of oil and then increasing the price of oil and we need to put a stop to this distortion. And while we are going after these oil index abusers we need to be just as diligent in constraining investments in critical metals related commodity investments by foreign governments those governments who have significant mining operations in platinum, palladium, and copper. Very obscure issue, but it's the same abuse. We, we can verify that, that we're seeing in oil, and it's having great impacts as well in, in much of our economy. And this is where my $11 trillion number comes into play. As Steve commented in his opening comments, a lot of attention, and Tom speaks to this very ably, a lot of attention is coming into the sovereign wealth fund a three trillion dollar number but very little attention is being paid to the to the much greater eight trillion dollars of other foreign government controlled investment vehicles and the reason we need to always add the two numbers together is because the Saudis themselves have just announced their intention this past week to shift one trillion dollars one trillion dollars from their overseas investment accounts into their sovereign wealth fund which just confirms, at least in the minds of myself and others, that these monies are all fungible. Regardless of what names and forms they take, these overall foreign government investments are completely different, as we've been arguing now for over a year, than, than foreign private investments. Because while some governments, such as Singapore, may invest in a foreign country only to make a profit, 
the larger funds almost assuredly invest from time to time also to further their own foreign policy, globalization, and now we know treasury ambitions. We have known for some while that while, it is, that while this is true of the funds of those countries whose trade practices are already overly aggressive, such as China, we now know it is true as well of the funds of the OPEC members, which comprise about 50 to 60 percent of the total $11 trillion of government investment funds. No one, no one, not the next administration, whether it be Senator McCain or Senator Obama, is advocating building a wall around America or for that matter any other developed country. But foreign government investments must be made with meaningful and actionable transparency and in a manner consistent with protecting national interests and national security, both national interests and national security, and with the stability of our markets. And frankly, as we know, neither is happening to a particular degree right now. Initially, some of us were mostly concerned about contrary investments in our nation's critical ports and transportation industries, our advanced technical products manufacturing, and our militarily critical items. And to allay these concerns, what some of us have been proposing for the last 18 months is that before funds make controlling or influencing investments in assets or companies, which might be contrary to American national and security interests, such proposed investments should be subject first to a formal national security impact statement prepared jointly by the Department of Defense and the Department of Commerce. These statements would consider a proposed investment's defense, security, and infrastructure implications. They would be submitted to Congress and their conclusions would be conclusive. But it is now very, very clear that the National Security Impact Statement Initiative, which I've been calling for, also needs to be extended to include the effects of energy-related financial investments, which means that we must immediately reform the procedures and the rules of the CFTC and of the New York Mercantile Exchange, or NYMEX, even beyond what Congressman Dingell is contemplating. Over and above substantially restricting exemptions from position limits to swap dealers, which have no physical commodity exposure, we now need to put hard, hard limits on which entities can even access these commodity indexes, with particular emphasis on their possible indirect access through con confidential hedge fund investments or through so-called rerouted transactions, again using offshore markets. The reason we need to establish these rules and procedures is because greater transparency, which Sec Secretary Paulson and his colleagues believe is all that is needed to bring good order to these investment activities has been shown to be woefully inadequate protection against abuses. These funds, commodity related and private equity investments are right now so obfuscated that no one, and I mean no one, really knows their true intention nor their magnitude. Put simply, we need to rein in self-serving commodity index investments which have the ability to crush our economies. And when it comes to national and security interests, we also need to inject strong review processes into the external investing decisions which each developed nation is now confronting. Absent both, there can be little doubt that when sovereign nations and investors which are mercantilist and are willing to inject something so base as to distort the price of oil into their economic actions, they will indeed win out always over nations and citizens like ours who right now aren't properly reacting. As an aside, something upon which you might want to reflect, but we don't have a lot of time to address later, but perhaps Stephen in the Q&A, is the fact that while the U.S. is certainly not alone in its concerns how to constructively live with foreign government investments, we are, in my opinion, in fact, in a very unique situation when it comes to them because of our massive over-contribution to the military defense of the Middle East and of the Pacific region where more than two-thirds of the world's sovereign wealth resides. It is very, very hard indeed for the average American to watch funds from these two regions buy up large swaths of our country and now manipulate our commodity markets when it is the very stability which we provide these areas that has enabled the funds to become so massive and capable in the first place. Let me close as it further relates to $4.50 gasoline by simply saying that ending the federal ban on offshore oil and gas drilling along much of the United States continental shelf 
as President Bush and Senator McCain proposed last week, would in my opinion actually be one of the most misguided and in some ways irresponsible things we could do right now. Senator McCain's economic advisor said on Sunday, and I quote, opening up offshore drilling would not only increase supply, but clearly signal the oil markets that betting on future high, process, high, high prices is risky. Yet even if both coasts were opened immediately, the Department of Energy's own Information Administration and even Chevron's Mr. O'Reilly have each acknowledged that the price of oil would not be affected until the year 2030. And neither Mr. Bush nor Mr. McCain is willing to acknowledge that roughly three quarters of the 90 million onshore and offshore acres are already being leased by the oil companies are not yet being used to produce oil and gas. And as for the signal to the oil markets, I must assure that Mr. McCain's economic advisor that there is no commodities index for futures 22 years hence. The today's solutions to today's energy problems are simple. We must immediately, the, the today solutions, we must immediately eliminate trading abuses of the sort we've talked about with much, much more regulation throughout the entire commodities trading system. We must stop the price gouging of the sort that gave ExxonMobil $17 billion of net profit in just the last quarter, and we must strategically use our strategic petroleum reserve as a cudgel to bring some relief to those Americans who are being most adversely Im impacted by these prices, especially our truckers and mid-sized farmers. Let me close by, by another answer to another question. This one I, I didn't put in my remarks because it only came up late last evening. But a, a, a remarkable individual, uh, a, a prize-winning individual, Pulitzer Prize-winning author named Daniel Jurgen, who's the chairman of Cambridge Energy Research Associates, is planning to testify up here today. Let me quote from Mr. Jurgen to uh, the New York Times, quote, there is a shortage psychologically in the financial markets, and that is reflected in the price of oil. You are seeing a lot of people who have never invested in commodities who are now piling into the market. But calling it speculation is way too simplistic. Calling it anything but simplistic is naive and misinformed. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you, you very Tom. much. Thank you. Um, Tom Gallagher, I think, could be better at the, at the podium. I should mention Dan Jurgen is also a member of the board of New America Foundation. And, uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> he's wrong on this one. It's okay. It's, it's good to have heterodoxy. That's right. Great. Well, it's uh, it, it's great to be here and to share the podium here with uh, with Leo. I, I just uh, I, I, a lot of what you said, Leo, is really provocative, and I look forward to studying it further. This I think there's also some interesting new information, new analysis in in what you said. Uh, in looking at the topic that that Steve. Asked, uh, asked us to talk about, um, you know, you look at these cross currents in the economy from uh, the drag caused by the housing bust and the, uh, and yet the threat of higher inflation. And uh, as I think about this, a, a story that uh, I first read uh, um, associated with Lyndon Johnson comes to mind, a story he liked to tell about this uh, slow-witted young man in a small Texas town. And so he needs a job, so he goes to apply for a job at the local train station as a switchman. So the station master's uh, interviewing him, and he decides to give him a hypothetical question. He says, well, let's say you've got a train coming from Chicago at 60 miles an hour, and then on the same track, a train coming up from El Paso at 60 miles an hour, and the switch is broken. What would you do? Young man stands for a second, kind of strokes his chin. He says, well, I guess I go get my brother. <laughs> station master's surprised. Well, why? What could your brother do? And he says, well, nothing, but he's never seen a train wreck before. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I don't want to end. Uh, I don't want to suggest I see a pessimistic answer to uh, uh, the question. I guess that was posed in the email that, that Steve sent around. Is there grounds for optimism? Uh, rather than deliver just a straight economic forecast, as, as exciting as that may sound, I, I took Steve's uh, topic as um, uh, to, to suggest to you some of the contours of our outlook and as and, and apply it to the outlook for the middle class here. So what I have is really uh, kind of two parts to what I wanted to talk about. First, just talk about how um, we see the business cycle unfolding. Uh, you see the summary of our outlook there, uh, our firm's outlook. I, I'm not in charge of the economic forecast, but uh, uh, this is done out of our New York office. But the shorthand of it is no recession, no recovery. 
That is, uh, from the outset, frankly, our economists had said no recession. They've so far skirting that just right. Uh, but the other side of it that I think is as important, if not more important, is, is no recovery. We basically have a 1% forecast uh, real GDP growth uh, from now through the end of next year with the risk that that actually uh, gets gets weaker rather than stronger. Um, it's, uh, it's a forecast that uh, somebody called, uh, it's kind of like purgatory. You know, it's not heaven, it's not hell, but there is some uh, punishment applied for past excesses. So uh, that's, that, that's our... That's our near-term outlook, but then I also want to talk about more of a secular change that, uh, that the middle class might be in store for, and that's uh, more policy or politically related. Um, so I pose the question here, will 08 be the reverse of, of 80, I'm trying to appeal to the inner numerologist uh, in all of us there. But I'm talking about the possibility that the 2008 election will be to an expanded role for government, what the 1980 election was toward a more limited role for government. So let me, let me go through this. Uh, again, I'm not going to give you a detailed economic forecast, but to try to give you some perspective on how the middle class is faring in all this, here's one particular chart that I think captures a lot of the um, uh, cross currents that are in the economy now. That is the drag caused by housing, the higher, um, um, the higher oil prices. This is a survey that the University of Michigan does that tries to assess uh, worker, well, just respondents expectations for their real income. Is it going to rise faster or slower than the rate of inflation? Uh, and you can see that this is just uh, taken a, a nosedive recently, well below the, 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 the shaded areas are recessions. It's well below the 2001 recession, but of course the, the consumer really didn't participate in that recession, but it exceeds or matches the, 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 the levels that this got in the previous recession. So the workers are getting pretty pessimistic about their ability to um, have wage increases that will cover the uh, cover inflation. That's, that kind of captures what's happening to their income. Then part of the topic also addressed uh, falling home prices. This is what's happening to the net worth position of consumers. And this goes back a little further in time, but again, a similar kind of a story that you just had a, a huge drop in consumer net worth, which is in this case combines what's happened in the housing market over the last year to year and a half, uh, but then also what's happening in the, in the stock market now. So this is a pretty a uh, scary time when you have, have collapsing real income, especially real in income expectations, along with the collapsing um, uh, net worth. And so what you've had is a pretty aggressive policy response by Washington. Uh, there are a lot of elements to the policy response. I think the, the, the Fed has cut rates. They've created new liquidity facilities. They bailed out Bear Stearns. Uh, there's been a tax cut, uh, the tax rebate checks. Uh, and maybe one of the overlooked aspects of the policy response is the success of bank regulators and encouraging banks uh, to raise more capital, which is, I think, a key reason why we're not, uh, we're not Japan. Um, but I think the one part of it that I want to focus on, there's a lot of controversy in a lot of, that, uh, in a lot of those policy responses, but what I wanted to focus on is the, 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 uh, the Fed's rate cuts. This looks at the Fed's policy rate, which is the Fed funds rate, and it's adjusted for inflation to compare it more easily over time. Um, and, and I think you give the Fed a lot of credit for the aggressive response in the first quarter. They basically decided that they had to get the, the Fed funds rate down to the level that uh, is associated with, with previous recessions. That is, they saw that they were trying to get ahead of the problem uh, with, the, with the real Fed funds rate that's approximately zero. This is where they've come in for criticism, though. A lot of people assert that the high oil price now, the high commodity <coughs> prices, are the result of, uh, of Fed easing primarily because of the impact on um, the commodities that are priced in dollars. If the, if the Fed cuts rates and the dollar falls, then people who are outside the U.S. are going to have to bid up the price of oil in dollars just to, just to maintain the same level of, of price. And I, I think that's mainly wrong. It's not entirely wrong, but it's mainly wrong. This next chart shows oil priced in dollars uh, and oil priced in euros over the last year. If the price rise in commodities was primarily the result of a weaker dollar due to the Fed easing, then I think you'd, you'd see uh, the price in, in euros uh, be, well, if not flat, at least mainly flat. And it, I don't know how easy you can read the numbers here, but basically over the last 12 months, oil in dollars is up 98 percent, oil in euros is up 71 percent. Um, so clearly it's part of that is the weaker dollar, but mainly it's something else. And this is where uh, what Leo said I think is quite interesting, and I, and I do want to spend more time on that. Uh, and thinking about that, what, what I think it's uh, mainly a response to is this. I think that higher oil and commodity prices 
are the result of overly easy monetary policies, but it's in emerging markets, not in, uh, not in the U.S. And I'm not going to go through all of that right here, but um, if you look at a simple metric to judge monetary policy, uh, what you find uh, is, is that the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, the Gulf countries have a, a very stimulative uh, set of monetary policies at the same time that they're growing very strongly, and that's mainly because they've subordinated their monetary policy to their currency policy. They're trying to maintain a relatively weak currency in order to stimulate uh, their export sector. And so what that's meant is that over the last year, as the Fed has cut rates, they've imported uh, a much easier monetary policy. So they're getting stimulus at, this, at a time when they probably should be restraining their demand. Uh, and that's what I think has really pushed up commodity prices. The BRICs were over half, they accounted for over half of global GDP growth last year. China alone accounts for a third of the growth in oil consumption. So it really doesn't matter much if the U.S. is slowing, if one of the biggest uh, sources of demand in the world uh, is, is running very expansionary policies. And so what I think the risk is, and this is going to wrap up the cyclical point here, I think that the near-term risk that may push us uh, create downside risk to the purgatory forecast here, uh, is, is that the central banks in the G7 are now almost to the point of saying, they're not quite saying it, but I think they're very close to saying that either the price of oil gives or we tighten until uh, it does. And I think that's clearly a second best outcome, uh, that you should have the demand restraint uh, in, the, in, the, in the areas of the world where the monetary policy is, is the easiest. Uh, and you shouldn't have it in the G7, where the force of the financial crisis is actually much more of a drag on, on the economy. And I think that's a pretty major threat to middle class workers in the, in, in the very short run here. Um, and it, it, it does uh, make me think of the kind of uh, premature monetary tightening that Japan had early in its uh, lost decade, where the Bank of Japan tightened too early. Uh, more dramatically, you could say that a, a, a rate increase in this context could uh, remind you of the rate hike that the Fed did in, in uh, 1931 in response to gold outflows to try to retain gold in the country. So I think there is a history of burst bubbles being followed by um, uh, premature rate hikes, and that can have some, some very negative consequences. I do think that the overall inflation situation, though, does constrain the Fed in responding further. So this is actually where I think there's an important role for another piece of work that New America is doing, which is in the, in the infrastructure area. But I think that going forward, if the financial crisis continues to be the kind of drag that we think it will be, there'll be scope and actually need for more uh, uh, fiscal stimulus, more stimulus, and I think it'll come from the fiscal side, not the monetary side, and I think infrastructure is particularly well suited to, to fill that role. So that's a, a view on the, on the business cycle. To take this uh, longer longer view about the role of government and how that's how that's shifting. Uh, I do think that the political economy in the U.S. tends to shift uh, over time. Um, the, you know, there's no stable role for government uh, in the economy, but instead it, it tends to swing uh, from a limited role uh, to a more expansive role for government. And um, you, it, 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 the, you know, the initial swing in a certain direction tends to continue because of initial successes, uh, but then you get the excesses of swings in either direction plus unmet needs that cause a swing back in the other direction. And I think that the, we've, we had a good 20 to 25 year stretch where the emphasis was on more limited uh, role for government. We identify it with, with Reagan in 1980, but actually the seeds of it were found uh, in the late part of the Carter years with uh, the uh, capital gains tax cut and deregulation of key industries. But then that really was the dominant policy theme, uh, so much so that uh, for a Democrat to be elected, uh, Bill Clinton had to run as a, as a new kind of Democrat and more or less conform to that, uh, that policy agenda. Well, I think that that uh, limited government agenda is, 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 is over. Uh, it's a spent force. Uh, and just as the seeds of the limited government move were sown in an all-democratic government, I think the seeds for an expanded role for government have been sown in an all-Republican government. You look at the last few years, just the outlay growth um, the, during the Bush presidency, the, the Medicare drug benefit, uh, the, the farm bills that were signed uh, or were enacted in, in, in both terms, the steel quotas of the first term. You see a lot of examples of the expansion of the, the role for government. And I think it's just more or less reflecting what uh, voter preferences are. This is a, a question that's been asked over the last dozen years by the NBC uh, Wall Street Journal poll. 
and it's pretty striking. You know, right after the Republican takeover of Congress in 95, you saw by a two to one margin voters saying that government is doing too much. So there, that was an expression of the support for more limited government. Uh, a year ago, that had, had shifted in a pretty significant way to a preference for the, the government to do more things. I think that this policy complex is going to have a lot of elements, uh, certainly fi financial regulation, uh, some of the things that Leo was talking about, other areas of the financial sector that need to be regulated, um, climate change. Just yeah. for the web, just because I think it's a very useful thing, uh, can I just mention for those watching online who might not be able to see the numbers that uh, in A, it says government should do more. The figure in, in, in those who thought uh, that in December 95 was 32 percent, in March 07 it's 52 percent. And then secondly, with government is doing too many things, uh, 62 percent thought government was uh, overactive uh, in 95, and today it's 40, 40 percent. Oops. All right. Okay. They couldn't hear me either, but. Okay. Hopefully they got to see the numbers. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I, I was hoping the people on the would be, have a visual on this, but maybe not. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so there are a lot of elements to this, but I think a core part of this swing in the role of government relates to uh, what I think is a fairly <coughs> fundamental trade-off between uh, individual security and macroeconomic stability. Uh, that is, I think in the late 70s, you had a lot of individual <coughs> security. A lot of pe workers were unionized. Uh, they had cost of living adjustment contracts uh, or cost of li living adjustment clauses in their contracts. Uh, they had defined benefit uh, programs. Um, and, but you could argue that, that those rigidities allowed the shocks caused by the oil uh, increases to translate into higher inflation and therefore macroeconomic instability. So you had the security with the instability. Uh, and over the 20 to 25 years, all of those elements eroded. Uh, there was more of a shift um, that, that basically the price for the macroeconomic stability that we had over the last 20 to 25 years was greater individual insecurity. And now I think you're seeing a swing back in that direction. Um, this is uh, I, I th this is related to that. This is what I think is one of the more striking charts on, on income distribution. Uh, it, just to explain it for a second here, the bold line is the average real income of the bottom 99% of wage earners. The light line, which you read off the, the right axis, the light line you read off the right axis, uh, is the average real income of the top 1% in the U.S. So what you saw is this, uh, basically this post-war period where the bottom 99% did fine, but then sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, most of the income growth in the country is really accounted for by the, by the upper 1%. Now, for years, this didn't resonate politically. Uh, all it took was for Republicans to say, uh, just use the words class warfare. I mean, you didn't even need a verb. <laughs> you, know, you just said those words and it stopped the debate. That's changed in the last few years. I think that, uh, that the home field advantage, if you will, has shifted to uh, Democrats and those arguing to do something about it. Um, and, and again, this is where the work that Steve is talking about with your new center or your new program, I think it'll be especially interesting to see what kind of solutions can be developed there. I have to admit, I start off um, as a bit of a skeptic on, on, the, on this front um, because I think a lot of this, these trends just have to do with the labor supply questions that are very hard to change. Uh, from a public policy point of view. When The Economist did a survey on China a few years ago, they had a very provocative uh, intro, which is that you think about the impact of China on the rest of the world as the reverse of the Black Plague. You know, that what did the Black Plague do? It reduced the labor supply by a high percentage. Those who were fortunate enough to, to live saw their wages go up quite a bit. In fact, basically the next generation was the Industrial Revolution to compensate for the higher costs of uh, labor. In a reverse way now, you've got the uh, uh, an increase in the supply of labor that maybe just uh, mean that the work of market forces is going to make it very difficult for policy to uh, uh, to reverse that. Um, Democrats may have kind of a King Canute problem here, you know, in terms of uh, ordering the tide of globalization to stop and and finding it's difficult to do. But I do want to end on a, on a more optimistic note, and this is, I think, one of the more interesting charts that I've seen in a long time. This will take a second to explain also, but it's the, the, the horizontal axis are the, in, the average growth rate uh, of real income by the different quintiles. And the two lines are the growth rate under Democratic presidents and the growth rate under Republican presidents. And this is taken from a, a new book uh, by Larry Bartles on uh, the unequal democracy, the political economy of the new Gilded Age. And he's actually done a lot of testing on this that, uh, that survives a lot of the challenges that you might think to put to it. I have to admit, I've never been one to really buy these kind of major economic differences under parties 
uh, under presidents of different parties, but this one, uh, uh, at least I, I think, is, 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 is quite suggestive. And again, I think the empirical work that Bartles did on this is, is a pretty inter interesting one. So it might suggest that despite uh, my thoughts on what's happening with the global supply of labor, that there is an impact for policy. So Steve, this is your goal, I guess, is to try to, try to affect the, the change if, that, uh, if you have a change this year. So I'm going to stop. The, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I probably went on a little longer than I wanted to. No, I look perfect. forward to an exchange. Listen, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Leah. Both uh, very interesting discussions, a lot of uh, interesting material thrown out. And uh, I'd like to, to open it up and really do run this as a conversation. We've got some great minds in the audience. I'll tell you that we do have a camera there. So anyone that walks down the aisle, if you don't duck, um, I will. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, yes, that's great. Very good. Very good. Uh, that's great, because we do want to, to, to be kind to those people there. But let me open up the floor to, to questions. We've got people like Joe Minerick here, Michael Lind, and others, and then we'll <coughs> arrange a conversation with us. Yes, sir. And, and I'm going to, you're going to take my mic, right? That's okay. right. There you go. Uh, Norman Bailey, Institute of Global Economic Growth. I think the title of the last chart was wrong. It said 1948 to 1950. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. In which case, it's not very significant. Well, and it's, that's, that's just a typo. I apologize for that. Should it be 1948 to 19? I, I, assu I assume it's, it's, uh, it's at least... At least 2005. Uh, that, it, it is. 05 is the reverse of 50. My numerology is... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll double check that, but that's just a typo. I apologize. Great. Question? Comment? No, no. No, just that. Yeah. Joe? Uh, just a brief observation. I, I found Leo's uh, information about trading in uh, oil futures very, very provocative. Uh, the first thought that came to my mind was, well, the Federal Reserve makes a lot of money in its trading, and uh, they supply the money, so perhaps the Middle East can do it supplying the oil. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the uh, the sources of the information. It would be it would be interesting. To and if I can piggyback too on that, because I didn't understand um, all of the elements of of the in, of, of the ability to set a foreign indexing, but your your talk coincided with a very interesting hearing. And we do have. I don't know if I put it on the blog or not. The George Soros testified up on the Hill recently about his concern about a similar kind of cycle and the instruments and indexes in which you see a massive rush of participants in. But, but George also looked at the consequences of this being a new bubble that could dramatically burst and looking at the consequence of that. So I'm interested to, to, to piggyback on this, both on, on the, the cycle of this, but also how sustainable is it in, in, in the sense, because Soros is actually of the mind that, you know, there are actually interesting consequences of the downside of the collapse of that. But Yeah, I, just to add yeah. one thing to your observation, Steve, it is in the nature of big moves in prices of anything to overshoot. And I guess one question is to what extent is an overshoot of the fundamentals, which as uh, uh, Tom. <laughs> Boy, am I getting old. Tom, I've known Tom for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> or is it 30? Sorry. <laughs> um, as Tom pointed out, um, there are we do have big increases in consumption in China and India, which are driving to some extent to get the, get the ball rolling. But uh, the question is, are sure. we seeing more than an overshoot? Uh, and is this trading phenomenon more than what you would see in a typical overshoot in any financial market? Thanks, Joe. You know, I, I, think, I think what, what Steve is describing is actually a, a series of inquiries that are going on. They, they started with, with George Soros two weeks ago in, in sort of a macro overlay of, of the economy, not dissimilar to where Tom was taking you. Yesterday was, was much more regulatory bent, and that's what will continue now for the next few days. The, the, the query that I think we all, ha and, and I'm going to give you sources for these numbers, but, but the query I think that we all have to ask ourselves, are commodity indexes appropriate mechanisms with such moment for people who have no underlying commodity exposure? And beginning in 1991, we waived the rules largely at the request of a now subsidiary of Goldman Sachs named Jay Ahrens and said that, that, that speculators could come into the market without any underlying commodity exposure. 
and it, it, we dribbled along and it didn't seem to have much impact. And something has gone wrong. And $90 billion into these geometric indices since January of 06. Nobody should believe that these indexes cover all oil in the world. They, they don't even come close to it. They're a microcosm. But they're the fundamental driver of price. Uh, they, they represent a microcosm of the actual oil being pumped. They set the price religiously. It is a one-for-one -one correlation. And so with a, you say, well, $90 billion, for me, that's a lot of money. In the context of oil, it's a very small number. But you have to appreciate the correlation between the index and, and the global price of, of, the, of oil. If, if 90 billion came into all commodity indexes, new monies where you set from, from 1991 to 2006 with no such comparable, 90 billion comes in, and you have to, you have to assume, now that we can't find this out yet, you have to assume that some of that came into the oil side. What we have been able to conclude is that for every 100 million that might have come in to the oil side, out of a denominator of, of 90 billion, the, the price goes up 1.6%. And we, we did some analysis. It is Kentucky windage. But with, with the denominator being 90 billion and, and, a, and a pure one for one correlation, we can track the 1.6% and the 100 million. All we're trying to do is assume that some portion of that commodity index was something other than coal and copper. And, and so we, we think with some conviction, again, we can be proven wrong, we think the range is a third to a half of the $77 increase from 58 to 135. The, the, I, I want to dwell on this. Most people believe who are informed is that the price of oil should be around $60. That's the price of what we've done to extraction, uh, pure physical. Uh, to that is added geopolitical, and, and, and Tom's slide and my comments about the falling dollar. But if oil were going to trade at, at, at the extraction price uh, without a lot of geopolitical and falling dollar, it'd be at around 60 bucks. So, you know, we're, we're not promising you that these numbers are right. What we're promising you is that the 90 billion is right. And we promise you that the 100 million and the 1.6. Last comment, the fellow who runs the CFTC yesterday in one of the great Casablanca moments of all time said, gosh, Mr. Chairman, this is to Dingle, boy, you may have a point here. I'll get back to you on that. And you go, are you kidding me? I mean, this is what the man is supposed to do for a living. He is not supposed to have Congressman Dingle, with all respect, point out to him the, the possibility of manipulation. And, and what I'm arguing is that it's, it's untoward if it is just speculation because there are humans suffering on this problem. Thanks. But if it's, if it's, if it's uh, sovereign wealth that's driving it, which we now think it is as well, it's a double problem. Dave, Dave Hendrickson. If your analysis is correct, it would seem to me that the major oil companies would have a huge incentive to enter those markets and sell the indexes. Uh, they could make a killing and they would drive down the price and so why haven't they done that or have they done that? D Dave, we, we don't know who Morgan Stanley trades for. It, it trades for airlines but it also trades for Exxon Mobil and, and we have a hunch it also trades for the sovereign wealth community. We don't know that. Uh, we, we, we don't know. I will tell you that the way refining profits work, and I, this is a, a, a connection that I would draw for you, with Exxon Mobil making 175, I'm, I'm sorry, 17 billion in the quarter, they have moved so much of the gain into the refining side and to the retail side that I don't think they're a, ma a major manipulator of it. I don't think they have any incentive to, to see that price come down by selling into the index. Tom, do you want to comment? You know, I was just I actually want to ask Leo a question here. Um, what you hear from most people in the government, not necessarily the CFTC, but just uh, economists, uh, say at the Fed or Treasury or elsewhere, 
is that, yes, you can see how the um, investment money pushes up futures prices, but to influence spot prices, there, there really has to be evidence of more inventory accumulation than you've seen. I have to admit, I, I'm just an agnostic on this. I, I, th I don't know what drives commodity prices other than, you know, many things. But what's your, what's your answer um, on, on that? On the spot price issue? I, as to why spot prices uh, have also risen. It, it, it's, if the investors aren't taking possession of the commodity, right. that means they buy a, a futures, a long dated futures position, but then offset it with a shorter uh, near term, the short position in the near term, which should theoretically leave the spot price unaffected. For that, for, for there not to be manipulation, we would have to find that the political conditions January 06 to June 08 had materially altered the risk profile, with the, with the exception of, of the Israeli Defense Minister's uh, uh, hockey statement last week on Iran. That's not obvious. The dollar weakness is calculable, and and what we're all we're trying to figure out here, and we don't have the answers. I mean, this is this may not be more than chicken little. I don't think it is, Tom, but I can't find, nor can anybody else, seventy-seven dollars of justification on geopolitical and falling dollar. What's interesting to me in this, and I, I want to go to the very back, but what's also interesting to me is is that while I understand what you're saying of sovereign wealth, the Saudis themselves have actually said, we don't, we don't see $77. I mean, it's sort of interesting. But yes, in the very back. Clearly, there could be a lot of fraud on the market, speculative fraud, but clearly also those some big fundamentals. And big fundamentals of China and India going from bike to motorcycles in the cars. That is tremendous. And a little growth of theirs sucks in energy in a way much different than any growth here does. So there is big fundamentals. And you mentioned just recently $60 at the price it should be. Saudi Arabia, $77. And you mentioned futures. But in fact, there are no futures, because you mentioned that there were no 20 years future. Why are they not 20 years future so that the market could go out and buy 20 years position at $60, at which price? At a 20 year price, they would find ample sellers because it was only less than 10 years ago that the, that the oil was on the $10 and that economist on May 99 said that it was heading to $5 per barrel. Right. So one of the lack of is the market the real lack of market for long term positions so that can consumers could buy for the next 20 years at a price at a different price at a long term price that makes sense. Why is there no long term market? Be because you, 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 you you, you finished your question by saying so that consumers could go buy forward. What we have is $90 billion into the market for which there is no underlying commodity exposure. These are not consumers. consumers. Well, but that, that's the point. It, it, you, you have to decide in a regulatory context if the index is for consumers or, or if it is for speculators. If it is to be some speculation, then you have to quantify the magnitude with which you're comfortable that there be speculation. But Wall Street runs politics up here in, this con in these areas, in my opinion. It's been highly lucrative to enter into these indexes without underlying commodity exposure. It's, it's gambling on indexes and gambling on subprime is just gambling. And, and it's been very lucrative to trade the indexes for non-owners of the commodity. Uh, this isn't the airlines sh buying forward. Tom? Yeah, it, just in terms of why there aren't, uh, th there are some pretty distant uh, uh, futures contracts, uh, not 20 years, but uh, I know I was just looking at some data the other day for four years out, yeah, and I know I, wasn't the I know that wasn't the furthest out. But, uh, five, five but, but when you think about it, why would a consumer want to lock in the price of oil 20 years from now. That's a long time to be carrying a position like that. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, don't want I, I want to go there. I want to also want to ask kind of a, a, a sort of a, a counter question at some point. You know, I, I um, participated in a dinner a couple of years ago with the co-founder of the Green Party of Germany. And the Green Party is uh, all about the environment and these issues. And, and he was lamenting what he then saw as the rise of, of a price of barrel of oil to around, I don't know, $40 a barrel or something. And he says, you know, for every increment of increase in a barrel of oil, this impacts the development of lesser developed nations in the world enormously. And um, I sort of countered and said, how odd. So the co-founder of the Green Party in Germany is actually promoting low oil prices to get other countries on the narcotic of cheap oil and gas 
uh, fossil fuels. I said, why? And it, it made me say, why not ratchet up oil and energy prices sky high? One, you create incentives abroad as other states are developing to get on something other than fossil fuels if you were going to do it. Secondly, it creates very different incentives. And then, you know, it raises this other question. Again, I just want to play with it for a moment. Yes, of course, there are really big near term hits. I was over at the White House yesterday, and Jim Connaughton, the head of the Council on Environmental Quality, had this uh, graph where he showed you know, in terms of real uh, uh, petrol consumption, which had been growing and growing and growing, was, was either the same, flat or declining uh, for, this, for this past short period. I know whether it was a month or quarter or whatever, but, but it was fairly shocking Europe, to see, yeah. in fact, that prices are, in fact, hitting um, use, in, you know, in terms of the, the, so there is a little bit of Miles this coming. notion of no elasticity at, or in, in, in this is maybe, maybe not true. But on the other hand, it raised the fundamental question of, when it comes from, again, thinking about the long-term interests of the American middle class, thinking about manufacturing and some of the dynamics of globalization, couldn't high energy actually be uh, represent an opportunity to begin thinking about onshoring strategies and begin using this as, a, as something that might have net positive effects? Leo? And I don't know the real answer quantitatively, well, but I'm, is, is it the wrong question to ask? Well, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the unfair question to ask yeah. because, because the, the system in, in a 3,000 mile of width country, uh, when, when you say, wouldn't it be great if we had high oil prices so that we would react and, 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 and structurally accommodate those high oil prices, the answer is, look at the airline industry. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have no alternative in this space. Uh, truckers. They can't fly on solar, huh? Truckers, farmers, <laughs> uh, commute patterns, uh, home heating patterns. Right. We're not there. Yeah. Sure, would we like it to be, would we like a, a greener economy? Sure we would. But do we have to accommodate the shock to the citizens to get from here to there? The, the unacceptability for me, Steve, is if any of this is artificial. Mm -hmm. uh, that just strikes me as, as an unconscionable imposition on, on the American consumer. I, I understand Iran and I understand uh, uh, China's consumption. I will say to the gentleman in the back, there, there is no evidence to me at all that the price from January 06 to June 08 is because China is consuming so much more than it was pre-January 06. It was on this pathway well before January 06, as was India. We know that macro phenomenon where we're, we're adjusting to it. My, my concern, Steve, is, is purely if any of this is artificial, and if any of it is artificial by the, the, the country that actually is the mm -hmm. beneficiary of the high price. No, it's great. Tom? Yeah. I'm, a lot of times when I get questions like this, I mean, are economic developments good or bad? I mean, they just are, yeah. right? I mean, they have consequences. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, what did I pay the other day? 460 for a, a, a gallon of gas? I, I mean, you couldn't have imagined in any political environment a year or two ago that could have gotten the price of gasoline up to 460, right? I mean, so you are getting some meaningful con conservation, meaningful development. You're getting more conservation and more alternative energy stimulus from the market trends uh, than you have, um, than you could have had from public policy, but as Leo says, at, at, a, at a real cost, at a, at a price. Um, also, just to the, the one more thought on China. Remember, the, the other piece of the emerging markets, it's not just that I think they have overly easy monetary policies. They also have fairly strict controls on energy prices to protect their end users from uh, fluctuations in the price of oil. So uh, they made a big deal last week when China finally raised the price of, a, I think, a gallon of gasoline by, by well, it was 19%, 18, yeah, 18, 18 percent, percent, something right. like that. I mean, in the U.S., uh, average gallon of gasoline has gone up by a third since January 1st by 100 percent over the last year and a half. So what's happening is not only these countries pursue overly easy monetary policies, but the price mechanism really isn't working. The global price of oil goes up. The consumer in China doesn't see that. It just shows up in the Chinese government's budget. Which is another element of this so state the, capitalism, which, uh, it, which it, Exactly. And, and so, about. you know, the, the energy market has its own kind of peculiar vocabulary. They talk about demand destruction. So what it means is more of the demand destruction has to take place in countries that have flexible uh, uh, oil prices. Pat Malloy. Yeah. I, I was listening to uh, Leo Hendry on the issue of foreign investment and his view that there are certain things we're going to have to do to be much more vigilant on who, how it's coming in, what they're buying, et cetera. 
And then I was struck by the fact that the only thing that we got out of the recent SED talk with China was suddenly now a discussion of a bilateral investment treaty. And I see where Senator uh, or Congressman Rangel and Levin have both written now to Paulson saying that they want that looked at in a much broader context of our total economic relationship with China. Because what I fear, and I see you thinking about this, if we got a bilateral investment treaty that kind of tied our hands on how we're going to deal with future investment and not be able to do the kinds of review that Leo is talking about, it, is that, is, that a, is that something that we should take a much more careful look at, Leo? Hey, can I reverse Tom, that, Pat, Pat, that? Pat's a member of the U.S.-China Security Review Commission, but I also want to ask, because I happen to be on a... It's technically off the record, but, you know, when you're talking to Vice President Cheney, I'm not sure anything is off the record. But he basically got a question asked about sovereign wealth funds and, you know, these things. He says, well, you know, in the past were they sovereign wealth? He, he, he talked about Japan buying Pebble Beach. Of course, it wasn't Japan. It was a company. It was a private, private player. But, but his answer, as his many others, is the CFIUS uh, response that CFIUS and the modifications in CFIUS have created. I'd be interested from your role in your own government role how do you look at the CFIUS as the filter to sort of deal with it? I think what's interesting about Leo said is even with CFIUS in place, you're looking at a potential dynamic that's beyond the bounds of, of monitoring within that because it's not that kind of investment, yes. you know, in this. But, before, but when you're before, talking about China. Yeah, but yeah. Before Pat answered, keep the mic, before you, you should answer that. I had a debate last week with a, 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 a fellow from Treasury who's charged with CFIUS. And he went first, and he, he was enormously proud of the fact that under his entire <laughs> seven-year watch, CFIUS has never turned down anything. And, and I, I found that so offensive, it, and it, it prompted every comment I proffered after that, because it's like saying that the, the, the speeding cop never catches anybody speeding. And he's proud of that. We, well, we know they speed. That's why we have cops. And if CFIUS, if, if the pride that CFIUS takes is that it never stops anything, then CFIUS is flawed, which is why we've been arguing for the National Security Impact Statement. We believe it should be put together by the people who have the most at risk, which is defense and commerce, and, it should, and its audience should be Congress. Well, as you know, I, Steve, it goes back. I was general counsel of the Senate Banking Committee when we wrote the, when the CFIUS law was put on. So you were happy with the so first I was very CFIUS. Involved. Yeah. But we, we wanted that to cover national security, meaning not just national security narrowly, but also national economic security. And, and as you know, the Secretary Baker didn't want that. We couldn't get it into law. So I, I, I think the CFIUS is, is, one, they look at one transaction at a time rather than context. Two, they only look at national security rather than the national economic security. And national interest. And I think that uh, Senator Webb, on the new proposed regulations dealing with uh, CFIUS, I think he made some points on on that. Interesting. Good thing. Let me let me get some more questions and comments. I'll go to Michael Lynn next, and then Meryl Guzner, then uh, 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 Dana. Well, the question for both speakers uh, uh, based first on something Leo Hendry said that uh, you you can't just expect people uh, to cope overnight with radical fluctuations in energy. There has to be some kind of shock absorber, uh, and also uh, Tom Gallagher uh, saying that we've moved into an era of government activism. And it seems to me, just to think outside the box a little bit, if you look at our energy system, we have a very highly regulated uh, uh, aspect, which is electrical utilities, uh, where you don't leave everything to the market, you don't have wild fluctuations, you know, uh, you, you have stability of expectations, you have either regulated monopolies or, or public provision. Then if you look at our transportation sector, on which our manufacturing, is, as well as a lot of our services and, and residential life depends, we simply take for granted this Darwinian, you know, laissez-faire world where uh, uh, if you have wild fluctuations in, in transportation costs, then uh, people are just supposed to adapt to it. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, is it conceivable that quite apart from the source of, of it's not so much the, the increase in costs I'm thinking about, but the wild fluctuations. Uh, shouldn't we think about some system in which consumers and in, in, in businesses are, are uh, buffered to some extent? To do what China from, from, does. From the market. Uh, you know, so you think of transportation in a way as sort of as a utility where, where the government's going to dampen mm -hmm. out these wild oscillations. 
the uh, interesting question. Michael, I, one of my comments right at the end is I thought that we should start to strategically use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And, and, and the audience that most concerns me right now are truckers and, and mid-sized farmers. Mm. Uh, they simply have, they're just getting annihilated. Uh, I would throw airlines into that category, and again, in a country of 3,000 miles of width, we, we built the transportation system that has no flex. And, but I think it comes back to the, 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 the gentleman who sat behind you there for a while, and, and this gentleman here, do we want the CFTC to be a, a commodity user's marketplace, or, is it, or are we comfortable that, we, that just with, with the stroke of a pen, there was no act of Congress, the stroke of a pen in 1991, we said no, you, speculators are fine, and now fast forward, we find that it is, it is, it's, so, it's apparently fine for what truly is the lifeblood of this country. And, and the answer is, I think I, I know. I think I have an answer for both. And, and but I think you're right. These the shocks are just breathtaking to people. And I think the government has an absolute responsibility for the unprotected to be protected. What's really provocative in another way about Mike Lynn's comment is that, to some degree, historically, Michael, I would argue that the huge subsidy of the oil. Uh, and natural gas industry to some degree by American defense policy, uh, strategic deployments around the world essentially for both not only move commerce but to move that form of energy was in fact based upon a global social contract of providing cheap oil and energy and gas to the American consumer and that these subsidies would be largely hidden and indirect. What's interesting is that we now have a sense of a wildly laissez-faire situation in which the implicit defense subsidy and what we were doing has come, come somewhat undone from the results, which is, I think, a really great Michael Lynn New York Times op-ed possibility. So we should, we should look at it. But let me go to Merrill. Can I go Tom? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm yep. sorry. Tom. Yep. yep. Uh, Michael, I guess the first thought I have on what you asked in terms of should there be some mechanisms put in place to protect consumers and, and industries. Uh, I, I didn't think that this swing of the pendulum back toward more activist government would go back to economic regulation. You know, I thought, it, but then uh, this month you had uh, Robert Crandall, former head of American Airlines, calling for re-regulation of the airlines. I, I mean, so I, I think uh, I want to be open-minded about where policy could head. But I, I'm, in a way, I'm surprised you asked the question because I would have thought your preference, I'm guessing your preference, instead of putting protections on for, on cons uh, for consumers or, or companies, would be to strengthen the social safety net. I mean, an area I know you've done a lot of work on. So that if you strengthen the social safety net, then you'd say workers, okay, now we'll let you deal with the, whatever the market, uh, it will have you deal with whatever the market delivers uh, and just provide the, provide the safety net uh, along those ways. I, I know that's where a lot of the people in the think tanks are. I don't really know the politicians are there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of carry that over to trade policy, the House Democrats wanting to have stronger social stronger environmental and worker safeguards in the deals. I, I, I don't know if yet they're ready to say, okay, here's a country that's willing to accept all those. Now will you pass a free trade agreement? I don't know if they're quite, I don't know if that's a real time uh, proposal yet. Well, well, my concern is with uh, the stability of expectations of business. Mm. Manufacturing. Right, which would be close to what Leo is articulating. Uh, Meryl Guzner, who has a great blog called Goose News. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I want to return to the second question. I had two questions, but the first one that I have for uh, Mr. Hendry is not all sovereign wealth funds are the same. I mean, China, it seems to me, would have an interest in not having high oil, oil prices, whereas Russia and Saudi Arabia, et cetera, and you keep mentioning about geopolitical goals. I'm curious if you, but I haven't heard really any exploration of what those might be, and I'd be very curious to hear you comment on what you think they might be doing. But my second question, too, which gets more to the comment that Tom Gallagher just made and the question Michael asked, which is, is the proper response in worrying about high oil prices really to deal with high oil prices, and maybe it feeds off what Steve was saying earlier, or is it more to think about dealing with the hard-hit sectors and maybe even putting a floor on oil prices so that we can reap some of the long-term goals of weaning ourselves from an oil-based economy? Uh, you know, my sense of trade is I, I, I've spoken here in the past that one size doesn't fit all, and that's why Doha, for me, is flawed in that, uh, and I have the same perspective on sovereign wealth funds. There, it is clear to me that there are some, Singapore, as I said in my comments, a prime example, who has no aspiration except to make profit. 
There are others who are, 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 are manufacturing oriented. China is one of those, obviously, India, uh, whose threat to us, if, if you can call it that, is, is in the advanced technical products, militarily critical technology list, arguably ports and, and, and uh, infrastructure. There are others who are by nature financially oriented. Where I think we, we might have erred in the past is, is not fully appreciating the latter, which is, is where I'm, I'm spending some time now. But, you know, it is, it is back to, my, to my, uh, uh, my, my cop example. The only reason I have trouble with jaywalking statues is because I love to jaywalk in Manhattan. And, and, and if you don't want to, if you have no problem with being assessed and, and judged on your behaviors, then, then the national security impact statement approach that I'm suggesting should cause you uh, uh, no concern. Uh, the, the problem, on the, the, and this is somewhat to Michael's comment, this whole social welfare floor thing is, is for a lot of friends of mine, it's death insurance. Uh, you, you've already died. And, and so I'm going to give you comfort. Uh, I'm much more of an activist in trying to not let friends of mine pass away and then worry about taking care of their families. And I, I use it, Michael, in, in the context of, of offshoring of jobs where, where some say, well, we'll just provide social welfare to the displaced. I, I would tell you that woman or man would much prefer not to have been displaced uh, than the, the insurance. Uh, these floors underneath them, Merrill, I think you've got to be very careful with them. But I, I think Bob Crandall may be right. I think we may, we, we may have run across something post-consolidation of, of industrial America that we can't handle these shocks anymore. We, we, we can't live in a free traded environment uh, across wide spectrums. Uh, Dana Marshall. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the problems with coming in late and asking a late question is that uh, parts of this have been asked already, but, but I think there are two, two areas that I wanted to ask, which, Steve, you asked once and this gentleman asked, but I think it's worthwhile going back to it. One is in about two months we're going to start to see the flotilla of uh, Chinese um, ships bringing in the Christmas stuff. Uh, they're going to be burning a lot cheaper, a lot more expensive fuel. Uh, Steve made the point, I think it's a useful one, Business Week makes it in his cover story this week, about whether we will s be seeing some different pattern of trade just because it costs so much more to ship. It will be important to check to see what impact and what policy response does China make to uh, the higher costs of shipping that their importers are going to be seeing over here. So, but that is, that is definitely something that I think is worthwhile looking at. The other point that I was going to make that this gentleman made, but uh, maybe, Leo, you could elaborate a little bit. Good luck in what you're trying to do to find where that, how we can crunch down that $77 or maybe $67 of unexplained money uh, that, that's out there. Uh, but one thing that I do think is important, and this is something that people have suggested for 30 years since OPEC 1 and 2 oil shocks, is to put a floor beneath which the government will say it will not permit crude oil to be sold. What that will do is to give confidence to everybody from the battery guys to everybody else out there that they are not going to be permitted to have the pu plug pulled from the competitors of their project. If we don't, if, if there is a big crunch down with all the attendant benefits that that will have to most of our economy, it would be a sin, in my opinion, to, to let it go down to the point where once again, and we've seen many examples of this, right from the sin fuels back in the 80s, of this thing dropping and destroying the competitiveness of guys who are finally saying, you know what, batteries can work here. So it would be interesting to get your thoughts about a, a gov government guaranteed floor when that becomes relevant. That was the, that was the question I really was trying Right, to I know that was the one. Wait, wait. Well, let me talk about uh, Christmas toys. If they come over on a Chinese bottom or a Greek bottom, I think it will make a big difference. And, and Tom is right. If they come over on a Chinese bottom, it will be a subsidized bottom. And, and so nothing about that Business Week article was credible for me because that entire shipping lane is a manipulated one. Uh, every aspect of their energy policy is manipulated by the government, including the shipping. Uh, sure, I mean, I, I, was around, I was around shale 
in the 70s. And, and there's a corollary between uh, protection at one end and protection at the other. You can't abandon long date projects halfway through. We're seeing that in the in, in the uh, coal sequestration projects now that have just been abandoned. They have no idea whether there's sufficient stability in, in, in the coal price to, to handle it. So, yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flip side. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I, I, where Michael and I were sort of talking with each other a bit is I think that that is what a strategic petroleum reserve needs to be part of. It, it's part of an energy policy which we don't have. We, we do not have an energy policy. We, if you ask Mr. Bush, Mr. McCain, and, and Senator Obama their perspectives on the SPR, they're all different. That's, it's, it's, the, it's a national treasury item, and yet three of the most, the three people that might lead our country in the near term have different senses of its, of its value and, and place. Uh, yeah. We'll Just go with the last question right here. Oh. Oh, well, and I would, yeah, Tom, yep, sorry. And I, I'm just going to say, I mean, I think a minimum floor is a great idea, probably one that you want to, you know, frankly set up as a tax, you know, so that uh, uh, just, you know, for kind of uh, uh, obvious, obvious reasons there. Uh, but I just think politically, it's hard to see the political system address a future problem. You know, I mean, that's just, uh, it, it, it's something where the benefits are paid off, you know, 10 years in the future or something, or five years in the future. So um, it, it's an interesting idea, but I, I haven't seen any. Maybe we need you know. Robert? Very quickly, uh, Robert Tread, international investor. Uh, we see other countries reacting differently. In the UK, the Financial Services Authority insisting that the hedge funds become more transparent in their trading in these areas. Uh, but at the same time, we I just came from a Department of Energy conference this morning. Uh, we see Secretary Bodman and others issuing statements that he doesn't believe there's much in the way of speculation going on at a, recently at a conference. We have another agency called FERC, Federal <laughs> Energy Regulatory Commission. We haven't heard a word from from for 10 years. Um, so this whole idea that both of you suggested that we need to move more toward uh, aggressive regulation, it seems obvious it's in our future, but uh, how do we get there? Final comments? One of the things, Robert, you don't do is, is, is let sovereign wealth buy into uh, the general partners of private equity funds or hedge funds as just further obfuscation of their role. I mean, transparency, there, there isn't a sovereign wealth fund alive is going to buy another public security. That's just ridiculous. They're going to do it all on the private side. And, and, and the UK is just much more informed about behaviors and patterns than, than we, we, we wish to be right now. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I guess I'm just going to take a chance to offer a final comment on sovereign wealth funds in general. Um, that what strikes me as interesting is how you have one group of people who want sovereign wealth funds to behave as private investors. And I think it's admirable to try to get uh, what Leo was talking about accomplished. But then in other forums, you hear people who want to, uh, sovereign wealth funds to act as if they're governments. Um, I was at a dinner that Steve hosted with a senator who said he wanted uh, sovereign wealth funds to fill in uh, in foreign aid, providing more foreign aid. I was at a session this morning where a guy said, if uh, if there's a dollar crisis and you have to make 10 phone calls to try to fix it, you know, eight of them are going to be sovereign wealth funds. So I just see this as a very unsettled area. It was interesting that after the whole Dubai ports thing, uh, the CFIUS reform kind of seemed to, to, to settle the matter, but I think that's just very temporary. I think that this is a, a, going to be a very thorny uh, issue to sort out for for extended period of time. I think on this final point, you know, with, with sovereign wealth funds, uh, uh, it is important to have this wide, wide discussion. We have with Heidi and Doug Redeker here with our Global Strategic Finance Initiative trying to look at state capitalism and this phenomena and, and, and how it all looks. But I have to tell you that over and over and over again, I find exactly what Tom said, is this senator or that senator or this member of the administration is, is more re regularly including sovereign wealth funds in their toolkit that they share about how something will be achieved or done. It's a very interesting thing. I, again, another uh, uh, thing to, to, to focus on. Yeah, but, it, but is, it, is, it a, is it an $11 trillion toolkit or is it a $3 trillion toolkit? Yeah. Because that's a big difference. Well, we, should, we should look at all of this. And I think it's important and, and to some degree disconcerting because it does set up 
trends. And you know, there's another part of it with our infrastructure fund. I, I worry about the future of the country. We had a very, very interesting discussion yet, uh, the other morning. I can't say what he said, but was Nancy Pelosi's chief of staff was there. And we were talking about um, how do you reclaim optimism uh, with, with the budget deficits and the capital deficit position, the needs of the country, and you just don't have the automatic ability to, 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 to go that without m moving down the rank, you know, where, where Tom Gallagher said about increasing the size of government, scale of government, and the debt of government, frankly, to create investment opportunities when you become so dependent upon external players in, in the world uh, to kind of keep the game going. And I think this is really interesting. And, and to some degree, what we on the uh, Smart Globalization Initiative, those of us in, in, in our efforts in looking at public infrastructure investment, want that framework to kind of restore some grounding in health to the working American middle class and how to think in a constructive way about how to achieve that, particularly when we've seen ourselves essentially following a strategy of building one bubble after another. It's why I wanted to include the housing crisis here. It's not clear to me that that's going to be so easy uh, to maintain anymore. And, you know, I tell people, and perhaps, you know, I, I really respect Joe Minerick, I knew when I was in the Senate, but to me what seems to be happening in, in America, in the American economy today, which is hard for folks to get their head, we were able to live in a, in a low energy environment and had a, sort of, where gravity didn't really apply to the American economy. It could be a very radically differently organized than much of the rest of the world. And it's kind of like somebody just turned on the gravity switch. And in that environment, you then need to figure out boy, things are behaving differently, we're dependent in different ways, maybe we ought not to be, um, and that's what we're trying to work through. So I want to thank Leo uh, Hendry, and I want to thank Tom Gallagher for being with us today, and thank all of you for joining us. I'd like to stay in touch with you guys. Here's my